Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, welcome back to Wimpole Hall Farm here in Cambridgeshire, run by the National Trust. We've been given early access to this, the State of Nature report, being published tomorrow by some 50 wildlife and conservation organisations in the UK. It tells of British wildlife being lost before our eyes. Climate change, but even more so, agriculture, are causing continuous declines, and in total, one in seven species are now threatened with extinction in this country. With us in this barn, in this historic barn indeed, we have gathered a panel of scientists, environmentalists and farmers, and we will be discussing the findings with them in just a moment. But first, here's our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, with this special report on the state of nature. Bucolic landscapes immortalised by Constable and Turner, Britain's green and pleasant land. You go out in the UK countryside and it does look stunning, but you can't hear all of the birds singing and you can't hear the bees buzzing. It's all so quiet now. 44 million birds have disappeared from this landscape in just 50 years. And even in the last decade, the numbers keep going down. This is the story of Extinction Britain. If you pour poison unremittingly onto the land for 70 years, which is what we've done, you're going to kill everything. Channel 4 News has been given exclusive access to this report, State of Nature. It's published tomorrow and produced by most of our main wildlife charities. It charts the decline of our species and it blames primarily agriculture as the key driver of that process. So, when scientists talk about a sixth great extinction, it could be that unless we act urgently, we could lose some of our most cherished species. From our shores to our moors, from our mountains to our meadows. We are one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. Strong or moderate decline in 41% of all species. Even in those identified as conservation priorities, there's been an average 60% decline. And in this decade alone, numbers have dropped 22%. So that's animals like the well-loved hedgehog, an astonishing 95% decline since the 50s. The water vole, ratty from wind in the willows, down 90%. The common toad, not so common anymore, with 68% lost. On the second day of Christmas, there were two turtle doves. Now 98% are gone. And the grey partridge in a pear tree, 92% down. Both may disappear for good. Once everywhere in dramatic flocks, murmurations. Starlings are down 81%. And pollinating insects, vital for life itself down by a third. In total, more than one in seven British species is threatened with extinction. Concerted conservation efforts mean there are some success stories. Otters, red kites, avocets, all back from the brink. But Dr. Mark Eaton, lead author of the report, stresses the success cannot mask the enormous losses we face. Overall, more species decreasing more things disappearing, so the net impact is we're seeing this, this decline. I don't think we can wait any longer, this loss, year after year, watching our nature disappear in front of our eyes without doing anything to address it. And if we let things go on too far, we don't know whether we're going to be able to turn things around. At what point does it become too late to act? The report confirms that climate change is driving widespread declines in the UK's wildlife. In just the last decade, over half of breeding seabirds experienced strong or moderate falls in numbers. So these are all the kittiwakes on the cliff faces here, and you can see all the nests there as well. Our seabird colonies are of international significance, and yet impacts here on North Sea sites are happening at an alarming rate. And I like it when you hear them talk, when they get all aggressive, it sounds like kittiwake. You know, when they're grrr, kittiwake, kittiwake, and pool. The kittiwakes share these cliffs on Northumberland's Farn Islands with puffins, shags and over 20 other species. 
but warming seas are affecting the fish they feed on and in turn the breeding success of these birds. As the oceans uh, are warming, it's meaning that the preferred prey of these sand eels is moving further north. And with that happening, it's taking the, uh, the fish further away from the breeding seabirds and uh, the further you go that the birds have to forage, the less uh, productive they are. When you come and, and visit the islands, it may look like they're, they're, they're teeming. It's quite easy to say, oh no, there's loads of them. And then sort of 10 years in the future go, oh, where did all the birds go? Already gone are 70% of the kittiwakes, and last year alone their numbers fell by a third on the farms. Their decline so critical that they recently joined puffins on the red list of threatened species. There's a real risk we could lose these birds forever. I'm a softie when it comes to the farms. But that's just because I love it. Sorry. Um, but it's not just me in general, you know. It's um, seeing the little kids' faces when they see a puffin for the first time. Take that away, man. You take that away from everybody in the next generation, and it's not fair. Human impacts are many and varied. Even if we magically solve climate change, British wildlife would still be in crisis. The report states the biggest driver of biodiversity loss in our countryside is not climate, but agriculture. It's very hard when you go into the countryside, it still looks nice, it still looks green, but there's very little life in a lot, lot of it. The fields are green, but they're green concrete. We have an agriculture, uh, certainly an arable agriculture, that is firmly based on poison. And if you pour poison unremittingly onto the land for 70 years, which is what we've done, you're going to kill everything. And that's what's happened. In 50 years, we've lost over half of our farmland birds. 97% of wildflower meadows have gone, and with them insects and pollinators. We're experiencing what's called shifting baseline syndrome. We think the countryside looks as it should, but we've forgotten how it's meant to be. We should have flocks of lapwing following the plough around this time of year. We should have yellow hammers, dots of yellow all across our hedgerows. And the turtle dove's probably our saddest story in UK farmland. In, the, in just 20 years, we've lost 95% of these birds. I just worry how long it will be before other birds start to join the turtle dove, where we only have a few years left to save them. Over 70% of our land is managed for agriculture, so putting back nature-friendly features of old, the big hedges which act as both habitat and wildlife corridors, and leaving field edges untouched, can have a genuine effect. What works for wildlife also works for farmers. What we actually have is a commercial crop, and then we have our areas around the fields or in the corners, which allows the wildlife and the insects and the pollinators to thrive. So the two can actually work in harmony together. We've now got uh, large colonies of linnets, um, yellow hammers, we have skylarks. Um, our busy, biggest success has been the lapwings. You know, I, I see myself as a custodian of our part of England, uh, if you like, and I think um, if I can pass that to the next generation with, uh, with, with a more enhanced biodiversity, that's great. It has been that next generation which has pushed the environment onto a global stage, but it's politicians who need to act. And just as action has got more urgent, public sector spending on UK biodiversity has in fact decreased 42% less as a proportion of GDP over the last decade. This is because the systems are wrong and the priorities at the very heart of government are wrong. We're not thinking about future generations. We're always thinking about immediate economic gain and immediate requirements. So what we need is systemic change. We need a really big ambitious environment act. We need to do it now. It's now a crisis. It's now urgent. We have left it so long. It is genuinely now an emergency. So is there time? Can change still happen? How radical does it have to be? And our governments willing to do it and our government's willing to do it alex thompson reporting well now we're joined by professor rosie hales
Director of Nature and Science at the National Trust, which is one of the organisations behind tomorrow's report, Phil Jarvis, who is a farmer and chair of the National Farmers Union Environment Forum, and Mark Cocker, an author and naturalist. Welcome to you all. Rosie Hales, we all thought it was climate change. Now we're told we're actually poisoning the land with our agriculture. Actually, climate change and biodiversity loss uh, are like, you know, two sides to the same kind of disaster sandwich. Yes, nature is in trouble. The data in this report are very clear. It's declining. This is the third state of nature report with essentially the same message. Now, we need to draw a line in the sand and really change the scale at which we're acting to try and solve this problem. Where does farming start? or end, if you like, and the government begin? Because the truth of the matter is the government has a very big hand in how you behave on the land, Phil. It does indeed, but I think what we've got to realise is that with 12 million extra people since 1970, there's a lot of pressure on our countryside. So I think going forward, we have to recognise that there's some improvements to be made, and farmers have to work with government and with other organisations for a real positive impact to try and address some of these issues that are raised. There's some very strong language in this report do you think that farmers understand they're poisoning the soil, as is expressed in this report? I, I think the terminology sometimes... I have 11% of my farm out of production. I don't recognise some of the language in there. I have good soil health, I have good bee numbers, I have good bird numbers. And so I think making sure that we use the right language and we don't just bring it down into a very small microcosm and say, well, all farmers are doing this. There are many farmers who are doing really good work, and we've got to build on that. Well, now, Mark, Phil makes the point. We've got all these millions more people than we had, say, 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, we have to feed them. Um, you've got to use intensive farming. So, you know, where's the equation going to be brought together again? Well, the problem is that um, it's been a, a combination of things. The whole narrative has, has been handed over, if you like, to the dominance of farmers, and we are recognising that the measures and systems that we've used are having repercussions. Nature is a single system, and, and you can't just insert your uh, ideological or, pro, or your uh, practical wishes upon nature. It has to be seen as a whole system. So many of the measures that have been employed by farmers, such as use of pesticides, can have devastating effects on pollinators. 57 crops that humans are dependent upon need pollinating insects. There are areas of China where they're pollinating by hand. So it isn't just about that we have to feed this population. We also have to take account of the system that we are a part of. But the second part of it is we have a moral responsibility this is a single planet where there is life. Go outside, look up into the heavens. There's nowhere else with the kind of complexity. Rosie. Well, I don't think we should beat up farmers about this. They have been responding to a farming system and a regulatory environment which has encouraged the practices which lead us to where we are now. So it's and we been do government. Know, yeah, we do know what to do about it. And there, you know, there are... There are uh, policies now being developed in government to pay farmers to farm for nature as well as for food. Farmers do need to make a livelihood, but we need to farm for food in the right place and in the right way. Now, as you've described, you already do, uh, as it were, lay fallow at least 10% of your farm. How long does it take to recover the land that is so badly poisoned as, as now? I think, I think the positive nature of putting things, uh, that 10% out of production, has a lot of benefits for my crops as well. So it isn't just about, um, uh, you know, so, so pollinators pollinating some of my crops there. I, I don't, I don't recognise the, the poisoning side of it. There's a lot of integrated approaches that we can use where we, the first thing we look at is rotations. We look at lots of uh, na natural processes before the last thing we do is dip into the toolbox for some of those things that you're talking about. What about the, the, the vanishing species? This idea that, that one in seven are going to disappear altogether almost in the blink of an eye. Uh, Mark, I mean, what are the chances that anything can be done about that? How can they be well, held on to? Well, I think we have to, as a society, we have to value nature. We've underestimated the significance of nature. It provides us with all of our food, all the oxygen we breathe. Everything about us is derived from nature. We're part of a natural system. So it's about us elevating. You know, at the moment, there is, like your report tonight, there's a, there's a deepening 
awareness of the issues, and I echo Rose's and Phil's ideas that, you know, it is about consensus and working together that will, that will change things, but we have to value nature, and that means we, more we, money. We also have to develop the common ground. Yeah. The solutions here will be in, some of the solutions will be in the hands of farmers, and, and creating that common ground will find solutions, mm. and farmers will be up for the challenge. But I'm, bo I'm bound to find myself saying, hang on a minute, we're just about to leave the European Union and we have an incredibly integrated food relationship with the European Union. How does that play into anything we can do to sort our land out? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I might say that the 25-year environment plan that our government wants to put in place will give us opportunity to be quicker and faster and respond more quickly than perhaps we would have done under the old current yeah, agricultural policy. But we need a strong environment bill. Um, we need a really strong agriculture bill as well that is really going to invest sufficient resources in paying farmers to produce public goods. Well, so I, I'm thinking of another kind of bill. How much is this going to cost? <laughs> well, actually, it's not just government. It's, there needs to be action at every sector of society. We also know, need businesses to play their part. They need to look at the sustainability of their supply chains. It's very much in their advantage to do that, but right down to individuals. You know, individuals play their part as well. This report was produced by the efforts of thousands of volunteers. So, you know, all of us can play our part. You know, get well, out... Well, we're looking at it, we're going to say, well, what should we do? Should we stop eating meat? What about that? You should join your local conservation organisation and get involved in that way. But they need to know, affect their own lifestyles too. Absolutely, they do. Uh, but, you know, it, it, good, let's not make, uh, you know, eating meat the bad guy either. Good quality meat, good quality meat farmed in the right way is what Full, we need. Sustainable, locally produced, with a red tractor brand on it. Those are all the things yeah. we should but be doing. But is there enough of it? There's plenty of it. Well, there's, well, there's, well, there's, well. There's, there's, there's enough of it in this country. I think also we've got to remember, going forward, if we want some public goods and we want public money to go towards that, there are massive benefits in not only farming and the environment, but health and education. Phil's obviously optimistic. Mark? Yeah, well, I think if we, we've got very good mood music. We may save ourselves, but not our species. No, no, well, I think, you know, we've got a lot of good noise at the moment. We need to see delivery. We need to see action. They've cut the statutory environmental organisations by 50% in the last seven years. That has to be ended. If we value nature, then we need to act as a society and we need to change our practices. Thank you very warmly, all three of you. And later in the programme, we will be talking to some of the young people who are fueling uh, some degree of concern of what's happening. Uh, Extinction Britain continues. Young people take the lead in trying to fight back against, uh, well, the threats to our wildlife. Some tell us they have never seen a hedgehog in their young lives. Well, we've revealed this report's findings exclusively tonight. Tomorrow it will be launched by 12 young people right across the country. The fight back against Extinction Britain is being led by young people inspired by Greta Thunberg. There are here some of them. My name's Jess Nichols. I'm 15 years old. So I was on Twitter one day and I saw a tweet from a girl named Greta. Greta's words weren't sugar-coated and hopeful. They were desperate and full of fear. And it made me realise that nothing was being done to solve this crisis and that Maybe we were the ones that had to be those people. We need huge governmental change to win this battle because I think our planet is worth fighting for and we won't stop fighting until that battle's won. I'm Myra Craig and I'm 17 years old. Ever since I was a kid and I was going out into nature, I've noticed that I've pretty much n literally never seen anyone that looked like me. Um, I'm half Bangladeshi. You know, we're going through... A, an environmental crisis at the moment and we need people to care about nature. I do these weekend camps that's all to do with bringing these um, minority ethnic kids out into the countryside and giving them experiences that they just haven't been able to have before and trying to get them to engage with nature. My name's Sophie, I'm 24 years old. So for me, I feel that there's an inherent disconnect between people my age and the natural world. Um, I guess my mission is to try and flip that on its head and engage those people in ways that they might find more appealing. So using social media platforms, almost recruiting an interest um, in a whole new cohort of people that perhaps otherwise may have overlooked the natural world as something to be interested in. 
I'm Dan Rouse, I'm 23 years old. You heard tales of birds declining. Curlew, I used to listen to them every evening. You hear hundreds of them coming over. There's now little wisps of them. There's no longer big calls, starling murmurations. You've seen them get smaller. Puffins, that iconic species to Welsh islands, they're declining. You can't have an island named after puffins with no puffins. There's no point fussing over all the other animals across the world that are declining when we're doing nothing about our birds. We need to wake up and start doing something for nature before all of our wildlife go extinct. I'm joined now by Bella Lack, who is 16, and James Miller, who is 17, both of whom are young ambassadors and are involved in launching this report tomorrow. What got you involved, Bella? Well, I, because I love nature and, you know, I think every young child is born a naturalist and fortunately I managed to hold on to that respect and admiration and when I was a bit older that translated into a concern, so this is just something I feel I have to do. And but, you, but you didn't grow up in green fields, you were born in London, I, I didn't, think. no, I was born in London, but um, as I said, I think every young child has an inherent love of the natural world and I've watched many of my friends, that love's been leached out of them and for some reason I managed to maintain it, so fortunately I'm able to do this. James, when I was a kid, we, we saw hedgehogs regularly, too many of them run over I might say, but I mean, we did see hedgehogs as normal. I believe you have never seen a hedgehog and you live in the country. Never. And I actually go out walking at night time quite a lot, so I would expect to see loads. And I know that my parents saw, saw them all the time around my area. But yeah, I've never seen a single one. And what is it that has actually really got you going? Well, I think like Bella, I've always had a love of animals and nature. And I think that as I grew slightly older and became more aware of the scale of the threats, that nature on our planet faces, that has grown and shaped into a desire to do what I could to protect it. But can you realistically change this? I mean, it's taken years to get to this dreadful point. How, what's going to stop it fast enough to save this one in seven species that might be rubbed out? The thing is, we have to do all we can because we're, we're in we're in many crises, but these are two really important crises, the environmental and climate crises. And we don't know the outcome, but we have to do all we can and pour as, much, as many resources and as much energy and time as we can into this. And as I say, we don't know the outcome, but... Now, you're going to be launching this very important report tomorrow. It seems that it's young people who are going to wake the oldies up to doing something. Absolutely, I think that's certainly the case. There are millions and millions of young people all around the world mobilising to stand up for their futures. And I think, Is it Greta Thunberg who's turned you on? Um, I think there have been a lot of people who are already aware, but Greta has certainly shown us a way forward to make a powerful impact and uh, show our appreciation and love of the natural world to, to our uh, elders. I mean, is this mainstream talk at school or are you a bit unique? I don't think it's mainstream yet, but I hope we'll keep pushing and it will be soon. I mean, what, what, what do they make of you? Do they know how crazy you are about trying to save the world? Mm -hmm. I'm sure a few are watching now. <laughs> um, most of them don't know, no. Because, as I said, I think lots of young people... Well, before this climate movement took off, it was almost deemed as a weird thing to be so passionate about the natural world. And I think that is changing. Young people are mobilising now. Do you feel that's happening in, in your school? Certainly, it's becoming a lot more normalised to be involved in campaigning, especially surrounding the climate. And a lot of my friends are actually becoming vegetarian now, so it's definitely becoming more prevalent. Well, James yeah. Miller, Bella Lack, thank you both very much indeed, and good luck tomorrow when you launch this amazing report.